All right, good sized crowd today. Hey, everybody. Thanks so much for joining us for our live Thursday webinar here at Real Wealth. I'm an investment counselor, Leah College, and we are talking lending today. I've asked one of our preferred lenders, Richard Advani with Supreme Lending, to join us today to give us the skinny on, on primarily non conventional loans and what's happening in that space. I feel like uh, everybody's talking about interest rates today. Uh, my calendar has filled up with people trying to figure out what the strategy is, how to stay nimble when it comes to uh, leveraging investment property. So uh, Richard is a familiar face around here. Richard, I, I believe you worked previously for Wells Fargo when we worked with you in the past and you recently made the transition um, to Supreme Lending. Is that right? Yes, that is absolutely correct. After almost a decade at Wells, um, a lot of our clients, mutual clients, have started to graduate to that 10 limit and we're kind of looking for a non-traditional option so we thought it was a perfect time to be able to make a move and be able to offer those types of loans that's awesome well we're glad you're on our team we need we need those investors who have grown with our investors into needing those those larger and more versatile loan products so i'm um, excited to have you here today to to dig, dig in a little bit so real quick, the strategies that we're gonna talk about today might not be appropriate for everyone. Uh, we might talk about, we might not talk about some loan products that might be more suitable for you. So you definitely want to um, be in control in charge of your own due diligence. Definitely consult with your own team of accountants, tax advisors, attorneys to discuss your specific situation. Um, as always, past performance isn't a guarantee of future results. So real estate purchases, like all investments, are subject to investment risks, including the possible loss of total amount invested. So we are making every effort to bring you the most accurate information as we know it. Um, but again, at the end of the day, you're responsible for your own due diligence. All right, Richard, I jumped the gun a little bit um, in kind of teasing uh, you know, our relationship with you. I, I know I, I was a member of Real Wealth for years before I came to work for Real Wealth, and I can recall seeing you on presentations in the past and, and hearing your name mentioned uh, routinely by some of our property teams in Florida, who I know you work closely with. So um, it's good to have you on. And, and I got to gotta point out a little bit about you, uh, which I know you'll, you'll share with us. Again, it's, it's you bring the firsthand investor experience, which I think is really one of the strengths of real wealth is that we're all doing this too um, and people get to leverage your time and experience closing I'm imagining hundreds maybe thousands of loans um, in this space and over the last uh, decade or so so um, tell us a little bit about yourself and a little bit about supreme lending before we get into some uh, some meat and potatoes absolutely yeah and thanks for the warm introduction and firstly on that point that you made I mean it's so important to work with a lender, a CPA, uh, whoever you work with as a real estate investor, it's important that they also invest in real estate because that's where you're really going to get the value um, for their services. So yeah, brief background on myself. I am based in Southern California, been in the mortgage business almost 16 years now. Early on in my mortgage career, I think about a year or two years into doing mortgages, I purchased my first out-of-state rental. Um, I was in California, I was young, I couldn't buy a house in California yet, but also, you know, my wheels were churning and I wanted to get started. So I bought my first rental probably 14 years ago. I really saw the beauty of real estate. So I started focusing my lending business on working with investors. So fast forward to today, we've closed thousands and thousands and thousands of investment transactions. And we really had one of the top investor friendly teams across the country. Most of my team are also real estate investors. And what's really cool is we've we've really grown with real wealth as well, right? You know, I started working with you guys, I don't know, probably a little over a decade ago. And, you know, investing in the markets, learning from the webinars, learning from the podcasts was extremely crucial in it. And I think that's one thing that we offer in terms of a value add. Um, you know, when you call us, myself or my business partner you're not just calling and getting you know here's your rate and here's your fees our calls are really more strategy based in terms of your long-term goals and we're really going to echo a lot of what you hear on your call with your real wealth investment counselor and you know i know it's it's definitely a good feeling to uh savvy investors or new investors knowing that hey you know what everyone down to the lender is also you know drinking the kool-aid 
for lack of a better word. Um, currently, I have a little over 20 properties across the country. Um, that also was one of the reasons why I wanted to get to a point where I, I really mastered these non-conventional products. Um, I heard about them when I was at Wells, and all we could offer at that point was just conventional loans. But in my years at Wells, I would often refer people to these non-QM loans, which, which we're here to talk about today. And it seemed to me like very often, you know, most of them wouldn't stick. These lenders would throw things on the wall and, you know, one or two of them would go through. So, you know, I, we made the, the, the transition that way we could learn the product. We could be that consistent source of non-QM funding, um, you know, for the industry because there's a big void, obviously. All right. So moving on to Supreme Lending. Some of you have heard of us. Some of you haven't. Uh, Supreme Lending is actually a pretty big company, obviously not the slow moving giant that Wells Fargo was, but um, we did about 17 billion in 2020. I don't have quite the stats for last year. Um, we're headquartered in Texas, but we have locations all over the country. Um, and it, the beautiful thing about Supreme is it kind of offers the benefits of working with the large established lender, but not the downsides of working with a lender that's too large. You know, when we were at Wells, oftentimes our clients told us that things were a lot harder to get done there, right? The amount of documents that we needed uh, was just ridiculous. And I started to experience that myself as I was getting loans. And um, we've seen a night and day difference here. The the general philosophy here is that underwriting works with sales and they understand obviously we need to get things to the finish line. So at Supreme Lending, we can offer everything from the conventional loans. Now, conventional loans are also called QM loans, are also called Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac loans. It's all kind of one in the same. Generally, our goal with a new investor or any investor is to see if we can qualify them for those conventional loans. Typically, those will have the lower rates, the lower fees, and of course, um, the overall long-term um, good effect for real estate investing however one thing we'll touch base on today is the non-qm non-fannie mae loans which even offer an interest only product which we'll get into but is is more and more important especially in the environment that we're in um, we do offer of course primary home loans jumbo loans and all kinds of creative products um, as well all right so I think one of the big questions a lot of people have is what is the difference between conventional and non-conventional? I kind of touched on it a little a minute ago uh, before I clicked that slide. Um, but once again, conventional loans, QM loans are loans that are insured by Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac, pretty much the government at this point. Once again, those do have a little more attractive terms. And non-QM loans or non-conventional loans are loans that don't really fit in that bucket of Fannie Mae for whatever reason whether it's because um, it's a low income documentation loan or whether it allows you to go over 10 finance properties or you may be under 10 finance properties and just be someone who's self-employed or someone who's retired that otherwise may not qualify. Um, I know most of you out there have a good idea of how conventional loans work. So we're gonna focus a lot of today on the non-QM, non-conventional piece, and how it's really important in this rate environment we're in, in the real estate market we're in, to um, allow us to still make productive real estate uh, investments. So one thing I'm sure all of us are kind of um, curious about, weary of, and, uh, and sometimes a general panic of is where interest rates are right now. So the first thing I'll tell you is don't panic, right? They are up sharply this year, but we've been spoiled the last couple of years. Historically, they're still very, very low. They're a third of what our parents paid way back in the day. Um, but even for the last seven or eight years, right, they're about to the average of the last eight years, but they're not much higher than that. So first thing I kind of want to clarify here is um, I get tons and tons of calls from people saying, oh my God, hey, the Fed's going to raise the rates. What's going to happen with our mortgage rates? And, you know, are, I want to lock in because they're going to go up. So the first thing is mortgage rates generally, and I'm not saying the Fed rate doesn't have an impact, but if you've noticed, mortgage rates have almost doubled this year prior to the Fed really taking action. 
That's because mortgage rates are based on the 10-year treasury bond. The mortgage-backed security market has a little play in it as well. But if you guys have smartphones, I know all of you do, if you have an iPhone, go to your stock section. And if you type in TNX, which you'll see on the slide there, it'll pull up the graph of the 10-year treasury bond. And the reason why I want everyone to do this is it's gonna take some of that mystery out, right? You may call, especially in this market, you may call your mortgage guy last week and you get a quote, and then this week you come in with a contract that's dramatically different. Well, guess what? None of them, including us, are playing bait and switch. It's just rates change daily with that 10-year treasury bond. So take some of the mystery away. If you look at that graph, you'll see what's happened in this year and what has happened before that. And you know, if, if a lot of clients try to monitor rates themselves, and obviously they don't know how, if you see that 10-year treasury bond, you see a 6% increase or a 3% increase in a day, odds are mortgage rates are going to go up that next day. On the same note, if you see a reduction in it, you know, odds are mortgage rates will move down slightly. So it's good to take some of that mystery away. Um, that 10-year treasury bond so far this year has nearly doubled. It's closed. It's about 1.2 to 1.3. Uh, coming into January, and it's around 2.4 to 2.5 today. With that, mortgage rates have actually also, of course, moved up. Now, early on, 60 to 90 days ago, a lot of the economic reports I was listening to um, kind of projected that that 10-year Treasury bond would hit the low to mid twos by the end of the year. And obviously, a lot of that's happened already, right? We're in the first quarter, and it's already hit that, and rates have already gone up. Um, the general consensus, and fingers crossed, you know, that, that it's right for all of us, is that much of the increase we're going to see this year has already happened. Um, I, I would expect it could go up another quarter to half a percent, but it's not going to go up one and a half or two percent like it has in the last 90 days. So um, I'm hoping from this point on, all of us, and I'm an investor myself, will be able to... Uh, plan accordingly and plug these numbers into our pro formas and know that there's not going to be a huge variance. Now, I've been doing this 16 years. Typically, what we've seen with mortgage rates will be a huge spike, and then they'll go down for a little bit, and then they'll go up, and they'll come down. Overall, they move up, but what we've seen in the last 90 days has been a little unprecedented, so maybe we'll all get lucky and we'll see a little bit of a down cycle. Um, if and when that happens, pay attention to that TNX once again, but if and when that happens, that's the time to act if you've been sitting on the sideline, uh, whether it's with regards to a refi or a purchase. Um, you know, purchase-wise, sitting on the sidelines, a lot of my clients do that, right? Sometimes it takes three years to make that first investment. And the only thing happening while you're waiting is rates are going up and they're getting more expensive. And that kind of takes me to my next point, which is even though rates are higher than we are used to the last couple of years, that 30-year fix is such a good hedge against inflation. A lot of the investors listening who've had their rentals six plus years, eight years, 10 years, really appreciate what that means, right? Um, you know, statistically, I think they're saying inflation is 8%, 10%. I mean, all of us, it feels like 15 to 25%. Um, and guess what's not changing? If you bought a rental property last year, guess what hasn't changed? Your 30-year fixed mortgage payment. And, you know, the cost of bread is going to go up. The cost of gas is going to go up. Even at a, a nominal 5% inflation rate per year, right? 10 years later, the cost of most things are going to be 40% higher. And with that, although it takes a little while to catch up, rent is going to go and move up as well. But guess what's not going to change? Once again, your 30-year fixed mortgage payment. They do not have fixed rates in any other country in the world, right? When we talk to foreign investors, and I know... Real Wealth has a lot of foreign investors as well. They're blown away that we have a 30-year fix because it just defies logic for the person who's loaning the money. But we have it here. So don't lose sight of the value and power of that 30-year fix. Even if the cash was a little less than you were looking at originally, three months ago, six months ago, what's also changed is if you had 100 grand in the bank, it's probably worth 85 today with inflation. You know, so... The hedge against inflation to me is the most beautiful part about real estate. Um, plus, you know, when you're six, eight, 10 years into a loan, your return on amortization increases dramatically. And what I mean by that is, you know, every month when you make your mortgage payment, 
or when the tenant makes your mortgage payment, you're paying down that balance. And every month you make a mortgage payment, the amount of principal you pay increases. 10 years in, you're paying a lot of principal and um, you're making a lot of movement on, on you know, paying that balance down. So as we all know, real estate is a long game. That's where you build wealth. You know, it, maybe it's possible to get rich in a couple of years with real estate, buy some short-term rentals and be strategic, but that's not the reality for most of us. It is a long-term play. And yeah. once again, that 30-year fixed is gold. Did you want to jump Real in there, quick. Leah? Yeah, I mean, I just, I so appreciate the extra time that you took there because this is the kind of conversations that we're having at Real Wealth behind the scenes. I was just in a meeting this morning with Rich and Kathy, our founders, and we're talking about this very thing and how... Um, it's easy for people to get spooked with a higher interest rate when they start seeing the cash flow, you know, going down 50 bucks, 100 bucks, in some cases, 150 bucks. I mean, it, it, the tendency, I think, is for people to start hyper focusing on these micro movements happening on the cash flow, and instead, and they're not fully conceptualizing the power of owning a hard asset in a time like this, in an inflationary market, and interest rates ticking up is to try to counterbalance the runaway equity <laughs> that's happening and and so we as investors yes we don't want to get i think hasty in our underwriting of opportunities um and i'm curious kind of your your thoughts on maybe how your underwriting practice has changed as an investor given these circumstances but but we want to try to zoom out as much as we can to like look at the total economic picture and just that inflation alone still makes these you know even six percent interest rate loans worth worth doing. I mean, how how are you looking at deals today differently than you did six months ago when we were all locking, you know, 3% <laughs> 30-year money? <laughs> That's actually a really good question because I have this conversation almost on the daily with, you know, some of my clients go back a decade and they're like, you know, are you still investing in real estate? That's the first question I get from anyone that's worked with me in the past. And my answer is yes, I'm always investing in real estate. And I am, I'm in contract on two properties, new construction this year as well that are closing soon. So yes, and I fall in the same bucket as a lot of you out there, right? Especially if you're buying new construction, we got into contract eight months ago where rates were half as much. And now today we're coming around and properties are getting ready to close. And we're like, oh my God, you know, my cash flow is gone. And um, just what you said there, Leah, is I've started looking at the, I always looked at the big picture. I'm a long-term investor, but I started analyzing deals from that big picture as well, right? I never used to put return on amortization in my pro formas prior to like six months to a year ago. I would, I would be blind to that. But, you know, when you look at some of these cash flows, you're making three to 5% on the front end, right? On your front end cash flow. But what you fail to look at is, you know, you're making an extra 2% or 3% to principal pay down every month as you're paying down the balance. And then obviously looking at the tax benefits, that's one thing none of us look at, right? So if you're making $300 a month on a property, 3,600 a year, and you're like, okay, that's a 4%, 5% return. Well, that's tax-free income once you factor in depreciation. And of course, consult with your CPA, uh, obviously consult your taxes, but for most of us, the amount of depreciation that we're able to write off washes out that income. So, you know, if you figure most of our tax brackets are at least 40%, you know, so 40% more on that 3,600 that you brought in is a couple percent more in actual money in your pocket. Um, and then the, the other thing I really look at, and I think this is the part that has got more and more people looking at real estate uh, than before is diversifying, right? The stock market's the highest it's ever been. And it started moving down. At some point, you ask yourself, when is the time to capture some gains and re-diversify, right? Crypto's chaotic. So, you know, if you do that, great. Um, but, you know, your, your fortune can go up or down overnight. The bond market's in the garbage right now. So where do you put your money? Right. And and as rates go up, a lot of us are in, invested in tech companies, but as rates go up, that normally affects, you know, the prices of tech companies. So, you know, I, I'm having a lot more of my clients who are like, I've got high six figures, seven figures in um, stocks. If I take out 300 grand, I can go and buy four or five rental properties. And it's a good hedge against inflation. It's diversification. So um, I really ask and I'll ask my clients this at the end of the conversation where better to invest your money right now you know maybe i'm i'm one sided cuz i'm in the industry but i don't know many places better and look when the crash happened a decade ago 
uh, the the causes leading up, the reasons for this were much different, right? If you had a heartbeat and a 780 credit score, you get a no income documentation loan with 0% down, right? This was, it was headed for disaster. And with all the financial reform, people that are getting loans now are supposed to get loans, you know? So I don't see the, a huge shift happening in the market. And if there is a recession, like any field, I'm sure everything will be affected a little bit, but I don't see with the supply and demand issues that we're facing right now. And, you know, I think in the next decade, we need to build 5 million homes. We're on the track to build two and a half million homes. I, I, simple economics, right? Supply and demand. I think real estate should be good here for the long term. And I, you know what? I'm, 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 I'm investing. And if not, if it drops a little, people ask me, well, what happens in two years if the market turns around? I'm like, dollar cost average. It's the same as stocks, right? You buy more. Right. Well, I'm eager to learn from you, Richard. I am almost m done maxing out my Fannie Freddie loans. So I want to learn from someone like you who has proven that there's life after Fannie Freddie. So let's get into some of these non-conventional loan products. Absolutely. All right. So is there life after 10 loans? I'm here to tell you, yes, there is. And I've personally done uh, a bunch of these loans. Um, I would say in the last six or seven months that we started exploring these non-QM loans, they've, they've grown to like 30% of our business. And every month they grow more and more just because of how easy they are to navigate for an investor. So these non-QM loans or non-conventional loans, um, the, the, the big premise of them is they're really based on the collateral itself. Um, you have to have a good credit score, right? Um, and you have to own a primary home, which we'll get into here, but they're based on the cash flow of the property itself. So it takes a lot of um, the qualification and the hurdles that you may experience with conventional loans out of it. But also to me, I mean, when, when I first started understanding the guidelines of these loans, it blew my mind. I'm like, no income documentation. Um, it's just based on the property itself. How does this make sense for the investor? And the investor meaning the people giving the loans, not, not our real estate investors. And it really gave me a lot of confidence to how robust the people that are bigger and smarter than us see the real estate industry being in the future. If they're willing to loan money with 20% down, so 80% of the money based on the cash flow of the property alone without any other security, then to me, I mean, obviously these hedge funds and all these uh, you know, people who study the data see that that's enough security to make an investment to someone, right? And if those guys, you know, hopefully they're smarter than all of us. It, it, when I first started trying to understand how and why, it, it really gave me some confidence, obviously, in the real estate moving forward. So um, the first thing about these, these loans is there's no limit on finance properties. And for those of you who understand what that means, obviously that's a huge thing for those of you who don't. Conventional loans, as we discussed earlier, Fannie Mae loans, typically allow you to have 10 finance properties, period, and then they kind of shut you off. Um, a strategy which we all, a lot of you already employ, though, with that is, you know, if you divide and conquer with husband and wife, you could potentially get 10 conventional Fannie Mae loans apiece. Now, eventually, once you hit that cap up until now, there's really been no options, right? It's like, okay, well, you got to buy it in cash or take a balloon or an adjustable. And a lot of us investors, including myself, were like, yeah, you know, that's out of my comfort zone. Well, I guess we'll sit on the sidelines. Um, so the beautiful thing about this is there's no limit on the number of loans you have. Um, we've just closed a couple for one of our clients that had 100 finance properties from the prior meltdown that they held on to, and we're still able to provide loans for them. Um, typically, these loans uh, can go all the way up and I know I'm not going in order here, but typically these loans can go up to one and a half million dollars per property. Um, now, one of the, the, the things that's obviously growing in popularity is the interest only feature. So typically these loans are 30 year fixed loans. Um, for a quarter percent more in interest rate, which makes it a no brainer really, you can convert the loan to a 40 year loan fixed with the first 10 years being interest only and then the remaining 30 years are fully amortized meaning it will be paid off at the end of the 40-year term um, the beautiful thing about it is you're paying just a quarter percent more to have that first 10 years of interest only now why is this such an important product today 
Um, I'm sure you guys may or may not have heard of rent inflation, but as you guys can imagine, as property values increase and payments increase for those homes, typically rent lags behind at least a year, sometimes longer. And the reason for that is quite rational, right? Most of the time you sign a one-year lease. So if property values have gone up, a lot of those leases were signed prior to them going up. So in that interim period of, of while we're waiting as investors of, you know, look, I got a property and contract on this property six months ago. Rates have gone up, property values have gone up, and now my cash flow is a little lower than I originally wanted on this property. Or if I'm a new investor, I'm coming in and I'm like, you know, it looks good overall, but um, it would be nice to have a little front end cushion, a little lower front end cash flow. Um, these products are exceptional because it allows you not one or two years for rent inflation to catch up, it allows you 10 years to have that lower monthly payment, um, have more of a buffer room on the front end, and still have the security of that fixed rate. And for a lot of our investors, um, this interest only feature has, has made the difference between the deal penciling out for them or not. And the reason I say for them is it's still hard for a lot of investors to look at real estate the way that we need to, that we talked about earlier, right? Looking at the return on amortization, looking at the tax benefits, looking at the pre appreciation. They're like, no, I just want cash flow. It has to meet this number I've always worked with in my head. And this, this really helps you to do that, but still maintain the security of a fixed rate, still have the hedge against inflation protection of a fixed rate, but have that lower payment for the first 10 years. So it's right. pretty exciting. I think I, I've got a couple of clarifying questions here that are coming in. This is the loan product that I was the most curious about, just knowing the compression that's happened. People don't have the room that they need in a deal for their maintenance, CapEx, and vacancy overages. And just, you know, the interest only for the first 10 years a lot of times puts that back on the at play in, in underwriting. Um, but the first question is, is there a prepayment penalty to these 40-year loans? Yes, that's a great question. And it is on the bottom of the slide. There is a three-year prepayment penalty on these loans. It amounts to six months of interest. So it's not something crazy. Same as the uh, as as the conventional prepays used to be when they were when they existed. Um, and after three years, there's zero penalty at all. So, you know, maybe three years later, like, yeah, you know what? This interest only has been great, but rents have gone up now, and I want to start sending in extra. You're absolutely okay to do that. Um, another thing, since we're down there, and then I'll let you jump into the next question, is these loans do have two points standard on them. You can't go lower. You can go a little higher, but that is standard with these non-QM loans. Okay. So Paul wants to clarify, <clears throat> for the 40-year loan, is the fully amortized rate starting in year 11, it's the same interest rate that you locked in the first year? That's a great question. And yes, it is. And that's what makes it beautiful once again. The only payment change you're ever going to have on the loan is after 10 years, now it's going to kick in principal based on that balance. So yeah, there's no balloon, no adjustable, no change in rate for the duration of the loan. Okay. And just to clarify again, the the 40 year see it up there at the top, the no no doc loan is is that applies to this specific loan product. It's a no doc loan. Absolutely, yeah. So in all of these, the, the no doc feature, the no limit on finance properties, the interest only, that all is one loan product. They're just different features of that actual loan product. So kind of on that note, yeah, we'll get into on the some on the next slides about um, how the no income documentation and the other features work. Um, but to kind of finish this slide, it does allow short-term rentals and up to one and a half million is the big thing, right? A lot of us are looking at short-term rentals right now. And, you know, in the right strategic markets, if you're going to Florida, you, you may need to pay 600,000 to a million, 1.2 to find a short-term rental. And conventional loans have limits in each county and each in each state. And we found that we're running up to those limits with conventional loans. So people weren't able to apply um, buying a short-term rental with the normal financing. So with these, that one and a half million dollar limit really gives you a lot of wiggle room um, to work with to find and identify the right property. And I will touch uh, in a moment about um, how they determine 
which property works, right? As I mentioned earlier, it's based on the rental income of the property, but we will kind of jump into that as well. Um, and we these programs do allow you to vest in an LLC through closing. You don't need to transfer it afterwards. Um, sometimes that's very important for people in 1031 exchanges uh, to have the vesting the same as now. So this program absolutely allows you to vest in LLCs. And I'm sure we have some people joining from outside of the country. We do offer foreign national with this program as well. A little higher interest rate, a little more down. You need to put 30% down. But if you're interested in that, feel free to engage me afterwards. Excellent. So as you transition to the next slide, you mentioned on that one that, that you can do loans up to 1.5. Do you have a minimum loan amount? That's a great question. So yeah, typically the minimum loan amount for this program is 100000 Okay. So still pretty low. Okay. So um, obviously a lot of calls I get are the I'm self-employed or I'm retired and I can't get a loan. And to be frank with you, the first thing I do when I get those is I still try to explore Fannie Mae because let me clarify, if you're retired or self-employed, that doesn't mean you can't get a Fannie Mae loan. But let's assume you worked with someone competent or myself and we determined you actually can't get a Fannie Mae loan, even though you have a limited income. The beautiful thing about this non-QM loan is there is no income documentation needed. Yeah, you heard that right. No income documentation, no pay stubs, no W-2s, none of it. You do have to own a primary home. The reason for that, they don't cross collateralize it. The reason you have to own a primary home is they want to make sure you don't use this no income documentation product to buy a primary saying it's a rental that you wouldn't otherwise qualify for. So you have to own a primary home. We do take a full application uh, from you and run your credit. There's no income stated on the application either. So when I say that the qualification is based on the property itself, qualification is based on the cash flow of the property. Generally, they um, uh, we look at the total payment, the principal, interest, taxes, and insurance. And when we send the appraiser out to look at the home, in addition to doing a valuation of the property, they do what's called a rent survey, where they look at average rents in the area and determine um, a marketable rent for that property. If it's already rented out, obviously we'll use the amount uh, for the property where uh, that, that it's already rented out for. Um, the beautiful thing is we take 100% of the gross rents that the appraiser determines uh, the property can rent for. And the reason I say that is Fannie Mae generally will only let you use 75% of the gross rents to offset that mortgage payment that you're making. Um, and if 100% of the gross rents cover the mortgage payment, including taxes and insurance, which I mean, I know most of the property that you guys are marketing and most of the properties I'm buying, they may not have the cash flow we wanted once before, but they are covering at least um, the mortgage payment. So assuming that is you can put as low as 20% down on these properties. Um, once again, it's that 30 year fixed product. You have the option for the interest only. Um, and the beautiful thing is if it's not covering for any reason um, the mortgage payment, then you have to put 25% down and you can still proceed with this loan product. Um, so it's really a fail safe. If you're trying to invest in real estate, you've run into issues in the past, if you're over the 10 cap or if you're retired um, and you own a primary home, assuming you have a good credit, there's no way you cannot get this loan, right? If you're willing to put 25% down, you're almost guaranteed to get the loan, um, which, which is really an exceptional, exceptional scenario because there are a lot of our clients that are in, you know, doing a 1031 exchange. And with 1031 exchanges, you have certain time restrictions on closing. And unfortunately, a lot of people run into issues getting their loans closed because they have six or eight transactions going on in process. So it's amazing having this option as a fail safe. It's also an amazing option for a lot of us who who have been sitting on the sidelines, maybe you are self-employed and, you know, look, we all know you make the money, you live in a nice house, but you're not showing it up on your tax returns. And some of us consciously make that decision that, you know what, it's okay if I can't get loans because I'm not going to pay 150 grand a year for the pleasure of getting a Fannie Mae loan. And this product allows you to still be aggressive with your taxes. Once again, we do not need tax returns um, and allow the self-employed and retired people to uh, accumulate real estate and to make investments even on a limited income.
Richard Rowland asked a good question. He says, I don't know my primary, but my rental properties are all out of state. Is that not sufficient to prove that I'm not intending to use the property as a primary? That is a great question. And that is something I raised to uh, our investor for this program. And yes, they do make exceptions. Um, I've had a little trouble getting a little consistency around how the exceptions are granted. But you know, if you live in California and you're paying six grand a month in rent, or whatever the situation, and you have a bunch of out-of-state rentals, and you're trying to buy another out-of-state rental, logically, of course, hey, I'm not moving into my $300,000 rental in Florida. Um, they are able to use some common sense, and um, we get the vast majority of those exceptions approved. Um, however, they don't like me to actively put that out there. But you know, if you rent your premium, there's a lot of us uh, who do that in California and other places because financially it makes more sense to invest in out-of-state real estate so uh, they will um lend credence to that and make exceptions if you are a new investor though you rent your primary you have like one out of state they tend not to but if you've got you know four to five plus a lot of times they will make that exception that's a great question interesting so on your slide here so if, if they if the market analysis for the rent comes in like five dollars low or or a hundred dollars low it, you have to jump up to the 25% down, no no questions asked? <laughs> uh, what we would normally do is probably try to have the client put a little more down to drop the payment. That way they're, it's under at the break-even point, maybe okay. shop an insurance policy again. You know, I get, look, the beauty of working with me is I'm not just <clears throat> the loan guy, right? I'm an investor as well, so I think outside the box, right? What would I do? Okay, let me see if I can shave off $15 on my insurance policy, right? And I'll hope you guys maybe get some quotes. Um, but the worst case scenario was, hey, put another 10 grand down, not an extra 5%, put an extra 10 grand down and that would drop your monthly payment and um, obviously now get you under that threshold. I'd like to say, hopefully we can slap some sense into the lender and be like, hey, we're $10 <laughs> off, man, come on. Uh, I haven't run into this situation yet, so I can't comment on whether they're that logical, but. <laughs> um, so this this slide really pertains to conventional or non-conventional. A lot of us who've invested in real estate, well, man, even if you bought something four years ago, you have a lot of equity, right? But is it and does it make sense? Is it a good time and does it make sense to redeploy some of your equity via a cash out loan? Um, and I get asked this a lot from clients um, and new investors as well that may have equity in their rentals or their primary homes. The first thing I, I want to say is, you know, leverage is powerful. That's what makes real estate beautiful. Um, you know, if statistically, and and I, and I say this because I was doing one of our, our mortgage, you know, licensing exams, and they kind of had a slide talking about the return of the stock market versus the, the real estate market. And um, on average, over, I think it was a five or six year, 10 year period, um, the stock market had returned 300% on your money and the real estate market had only gone up 100%, right? And you're like, oh, well, stocks went up three times more. The stocks are probably the better investment. Well, one thing it clarified, though, is most of us aren't buying real estate in cash, right? We're putting 20% down. And once you factor in the leverage, right, that we put 20% down on that $300,000 home and we were able to take advantage of the growth of that asset, the return worked out to 3,000% um, for... Uh, real estate investments once you factor in that leverage. So first thing I'll say, I believe in leverage. I think it's beautiful, but I'm a little more conservative. I don't want to over leverage either, right? Um, I don't want to take all of my whole portfolio to 75% max loan to value and then use that to go buy a bunch more rentals at max loan to value. I'm not saying it's a bad strategy, but that's not what I'm saying here. Um, what I'm trying to say is, does it make sense? You know, let's say you have a property you bought for 200,000 seven years ago in Texas or in Florida, and it's worth 400,000 today, and you owe 130,000 on it. Does it make sense to maybe take 100,000 out of that property, right? That would take you to a $270,000 loan on a $400,000 property. It'll give you money to invest in one to two rentals, depending on where you're investing, and it'll still keep your loan to value and your equity position on that property low, right? And Everyone's situation is a little different and obviously work with, you know, your investment counselor at Real Wealth and your financial advisor. But a lot of times it does make sense, just like a 1031 makes sense, right? If you could pull 
and, and in that broad level example we're using, and a lot of you will be like, you know what, actually, that's me. I fall in that bucket, right? But you bought that property six or seven years ago. It's you know worth 400,000 today. You bought it for 200. Rents have definitely gone up as well. And you're, you've got a, a lot bigger margin of cash flow than you already had planned for, right? A lot of times you can pull 100,000 cash out, still leave a lot of equity in the property, still make a good cash flow on that property, right? And now you've got 100,000 to reinvest in another property uh, to conservatively, responsibly grow your real estate portfolio more. You're not over leveraging, you're being smart. Um, I absolutely think that's a great idea. And we're seeing a lot more people take advantage of it. The other thing to keep in mind is it's it's essentially tax-free money, right? Where else can you access 100,000 without having to pay tax on it? Pull it out of your 401k, pull it out of your retirement, you go make it at your job, you're still gonna pay income tax on it, right? You're gonna end up with 60 of that 100. And another beautiful thing about real estate is now you can pull 100,000 out, right? You're not gonna pay any income tax on that 100,000. In fact, it'll probably reduce your income tax a little because now you're writing off more interest on that property, showing a little less of a profit. And now you're able to redeploy in um, another property. And, you know, versus your other options are selling some stocks, right? Or, or you know, once again, selling an actual asset. This allows you to reinvest, capture some of that equity without selling the asset. Um, and once again, we're seeing a lot of investors who in the last five years, they've done very well. They've invested in a lot of real estate, but they're like, I don't have the funds to continue to go. You know, but also I don't want to, you know, over leverage. And, you know, so what I, I, I say is, you know, don't be afraid to explore this option, right? We'll all run the numbers and see if it makes sense. See if, now if we run the numbers and you're like, oh God, 100,000 out on that property, even though you have the equity is going to make your cash flow like dangerous. It doesn't give you a buffer. It's going to give you anxiety. Well, let's not do that. But for a lot of you out there, I think you will see is once you run the numbers, um, it will make sense to cash out on properties where you have a good amount of equity and then you factor in the return on where you're redeploying it right and that's how you can kind of stack and build wealth with real estate is you know leveraging um that cash out and obviously they say at the end you know leverage responsibly um you know we don't recommend neither leah real wealth or myself recommends over leveraging um but it is a tool and it and that 30-year fix once again is a tool um available really to us in this country and not other people Richard, somebody asked the question here, and my mind went to this too, as you were just talking about the benefits of a cash out refinance. Can you do a cash out refinance into that 40 year loan that you talked about? Absolutely. So um, we were talking about conventional or non-QM in, in this conversation on cash out, but yes, we have conventional options and we also have the non-QM, no doc, over 10 cash flow, interest only option as well. So you do have access um, to either of them. Great. Um, a lot of questions coming in. Everybody wants to know like ballpark rate range right now. <laughs> I knew that was coming. I pulled it up right before. So um, for these non-conventional loans, they're about on average a percent higher than conventional loans. And um, those of you who have gotten a quote recently, you know, um, you won't have a heart attack. If you haven't, please make sure you're sitting down. Um, but broadly, right, Four months ago, you could get an investor loan in the high threes with 25% down. Just um, give it to us, Richard. We're ready. <laughs> okay. So on average, conventional loans are in the mid fives right now, high fives if you're putting 20% down. These non-traditional loans are like the, the mid sixes, 6.6, 6 6.7 for the 30-year fixed. If you want to exercise interest only, it adds a quarter percent to that. So about a percent higher than the conventional loans are. Um, but you know, it's important to weigh out those options, right? When, if you, when you guys call into me, we're going to look at conventional as an option. We'll look at the payments, look at the fees, we'll look at non QM interest only as an option and kind of analyze the difference between the two and determine the best path forward for you. Yeah, I think that's a good plug to make. I mean, so much about underwriting or financing is is individualized. What you what you can do, what you are looking to do in the future, and I think to to plug the benefit again of working with someone who's not just a transactional broker who's trying to like close a deal and move you on. They're thinking long term about your investing future. You know, um, those kind of conversations. You guys have those kinds of conversations with our members on the regular. 
Absolutely. Well, I'm sure all you can tell I'm I'm passionate about real estate. I'm passionate about what we all do. I picked the the mortgage side of real estate, but don't get me wrong. I mean, I'm I'm, I'm I consider myself a real estate professional almost, and and you know, and a lot of that comes out in those conversations, right? Whether you're new or experienced, I guarantee that you know I can add value. Um, not and that value is not just getting the loan done. That will do. That's my job to do. But, um, you know, we offer a lot of value in the planning and the strategy. Um, and then also, you know, I, I'm investing in all these markets too, right? So a lot of the times um, clients haven't visited a market. And I bought my first half dozen properties never going. Um, and now I choose to go wherever I buy, um, not because I think I need to to make a prudent investment, but because I want to be that value add, right? If you call me and you know, and and um, you know, you 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 talking to the Florida market or whatever market, and and you know, you bought one or two there, and I'm like, oh yeah, I was in Florida last week. I visited with them too. This is what I thought. Um, and you know, we make it a point to know what's going on in the markets as well, so we can be that value add and and you know, really echo what what you know, real wealth is working at together uh, with all of the investors, which is you know, to educate you so you make prudent decisions. Um, and then strategize together. You know. So 1031 investors, uh, if you don't know what a 1031 exchange is, I'll give you a broad level, but um, the IRS has a provision that allows you to sell a piece of property, let's say that you bought 10 years ago or however long for 200,000 and now it's gone up to 600,000, right? So you have a huge gain. Typically, if you wanted to capture that gain, you would either cash out, as we discussed earlier, or sell the property. If you sold the property, you would need to pay capital gains tax on all that money you made with that real estate. A 1031 allows you to take that investment and redeploy it and sell the property and redeploy it into other like real estate investments without paying any of the, the um, capital gains or with deferring that capital gain. So it's a beautiful product. If you guys are familiar with 1031, uh, this will resonate even more importantly, but it's extremely, extremely important to work with a lender that, and, and you know, look, all of Real Wealth's lenders, I've worked with them myself as a consumer, all of them are great, but it's important to work with someone that is experienced with 1031 exchanges. And also that means experience with real estate investors. Um, a lot of times people will try to go outside of the preferred lender group of real wealth. And look, they don't get anything by referring all of you investors to us, right? They just know from experience, we're trusted, we're true. They've, they've, they've really scrubbed us to make sure that we're a good fit. But if you go to ABC loan officer who sits at Bank of America that helped you with your primary home, guess what? They're not going to know the investor guidelines, but that's not the most important thing. The important thing is, that loan officers, underwriters, and processors, the ones who decide if you're gonna get the loan, are only used to the business that loan officer brings in. So guess what? Guess what that underwriter looks at all day? Primary home buyers, W-2 wage earners, vanilla loans. Then we come in with like, hey, we've got eight, I've got eight loans, buying three more, you know, I just sold six. You know, that investor client, they get scared. And and I deal with that when I when I moved to Supreme. We had to train them on the investor loan program like don't be scared this is normal this is a good thing um and they're educated um so a lot of times we can get things done that other lenders can't not because we have a magic wand it's because we understand the ins and outs of every single part of these investor guidelines because we live it day in day out um so work with one of real wealth network's preferred lenders um because there is extreme value and the last thing you want is with a 1031, you have a 45-day identification period and a six-month window to close. And if you don't close on time, you're paying tax on that money. And you know, working with the lender, once again, who's experienced with it, working with the lender who's licensed in all the markets you want to invest in is extremely, extremely, extremely important. And the reason why I have a slide on it and the reason why I'm so um, you know, adamant on it is because we see people making those mistakes. And then we see them getting a $200,000 tax bill. And I wish I could record all the clients for like, you know what, you guys were right. We should have listened. We should have used, you know, an investor, investment specific lender and they did not. So um, obviously we're very competent in working with 1031 exchanges. We handle tons of them every month. Um, if you guys have them, please consider us or call and pick my brain. Even if you want to use someone else, we're here to help educate. All right, so I think that pretty much recaps my stuff. I know we have some questions. 
I just wanted to thank you, Leah, and thank Real Wealth, of course, for giving us the opportunity to share with you guys again. The last recap thing I'll say before we go to Q&A is, um, to the investors out there, don't be afraid to call and ask questions. A lot of investing prudently in real estate is the education part. I'm not gonna try to pull your credit. I'm not gonna try to get your blood samples. We can call and just have a conversation, whether you're ready in a month or in a year. Um, planning is very, very important. So feel free to leverage me as a resource for that. And thank you very much. Excellent. So we'll leave Richard's contact information here on the screen while we go through some of the questions. But keep in mind, we've recorded this webinar. We're going to archive it on Richard Advani's page. So when you're logged into the Realty Portal, um, you can hover over resources and you'll see Supreme Lending is actually listed under both conventional lenders and non-conventional lenders. It takes you to the same page where you can find this replay. Uh, and you can always get Richard's contact information. So if six months from now you find yourself recalling this info and you want to reach out to Richard, his his info will forever live there. Um, okay, let's make our way through some of these questions. There really are um, some good questions coming in. Um, Dee Dee has a question about uh, investing in short-term rentals. She says, I'm investing in short-term rentals. Can I have an LLC with passive investors when I take this loan? If three of us are buying an STR, do we all need to be on the loan or would we have an LLC buying the property? That's a great question. So with these non-QM loans, they do allow you to vest title in an LLC through closing, but the loans still are made to you personally. Um, so it still will show up on your personal credit. Um, Further, typically with these loans, they want all members of the LLC to be on the loan. And it's really made for that one to maximum two investor LLC setup. Um, it's not meant for syndications. Um, or if you have you know, six uh, uh, members on an LLC, typically they will shun away from that. Okay, while we're on the topic of entities, can I refi a property that was under my name into an LLC? Will there be any tax implication for this? Let's first qualify you, Richard. You're not a CPA, but what do you think? Absolutely, thank you. And yeah, I'm not a CPA, I'm not a tax expert, but from my experience, I can tell you if there's a transfer of ownership, which is what that is, the county of where the property is typically will reassess it and um, charge you a transfer tax. Um, plus your property taxes may be based on that value of when you transfer. So um, yes, it's something you can do, but pay a lot of attention into those fine details because it could cost you money in the long run. Okay, is this loan only for purchase or can I add rehab money into the loan? Another great question. Unfortunately, it is just for purchase. Um, you cannot factor in rehab money. However, once you do buy a property, if you buy it in all cash, it does allow you to immediately access that cash. Um, but uh, you're, you are capped at that original appraised value. Okay. And I know the answer to this question because I reached out to you last week about it, Richard. Do you offer any construction loans or construction to perm loans? Unfortunately, not at the moment. Um, we as a company are do offer them. However, myself and my team have not got acclimated with them yet. Much like these non-QM programs, we wanna make sure we master them. That way you guys aren't our test experiments. And when we bring it to Real Wealth and we bring it to you guys, um, we are able to get them done effectively and efficiently. Um, and more effectively and efficiently than some of the other new construction partners they have. So I'm the type of person and the type of um, a lender that if I know you have a better option somewhere else, I'm going to send you there, even if it means I'm not going to make a transaction because this is a long-term uh, relationship with all of us. Yeah, well. And at the moment, new construction is better elsewhere. But right. stay tuned. Right. Well, send them send them our way when you when you've got a plan together. We've got some opportunities with some of our teams, as I, I explained to you, who are doing you know they're building direct for investors, but it's cash only setup unless you can bring some financing to the table. And and our I was told from our team that the builder would entertain um uh you know working with a lending situation if we could find someone. So uh, we'll stay in close contact there if you crack the code. Okay. Um, I am thinking of moving my rental market in Dallas or to Dallas from California. Can I lease back a property from my LLC with this product while I search out a neighborhood to buy a new primary residence in? 
No, that's a great question. I had someone, a very shrewd investor, really push that one home. And I was like, well, technically it's a primary home. And he's like, well, it's not because my LLC is going to own it and I'm going to rent it from them. Um, which, which technically I get, you're, you're right, but no, that won't work, unfortunately. I, to, uh, to, to my better judgment, I did escalate it to that. They kind of laughed at me. They were like, no. But yeah, unfortunately, you can't. Uh, you can't lease it back from yourself. All right, what about um, rural areas in Colorado? That's a good question, actually, and that's something I didn't touch on. So this non-QM product is very, obviously it's, it's all qualified based on the property itself. So they are, they are uh, I wouldn't say strict, but they do wanna make sure that there are comparable sales available. Generally rural areas can get a little tough on that. I would not expect rural areas to be a good match for this product. Neither are townhomes or condos. They're great for single family homes, great for multi-units, um, but they're because it's all collateral based, uh, they, they do look at things a little closer than Fannie Mae. And we haven't run into any issues with any anything we've worked with with uh, Real Wealth Network, um, but I did have someone bring a, a pretty rural property over and it's not something this non-QM product has an appetite for. Mm -hmm. However, conventional does. So, you know, if you can still fit in that conventional bucket, we do have options for you. What's the concern with a condo or a townhome? You know what, we had a whole development that we were doing um, and it kind of went a little south. Um, they have restrictions on um, uh, how many, of course, they want to have in that same condo development. They had a lot of questions, even more so about investor concentration and budget and reserves of the complex, even more than Fannie Mae. Uh, if you guys aren't aware, uh, you know, Fannie Mae also conventional requires a review of the condo complex, as does the non-QM, but they were, sh they, they were uh, not very consistent with their guidelines and direction on how I can evaluate the condo complex. Um, so we, we shun away from them. Once again, we want to tailor the experience to be good for you guys and not bring you along a process that I know is not, can end in disaster. And that's what happened with um, the condo deal we tried with them. So mm -hmm. generally, I would say no. If you want to bring a one-on-one -on -one case by case basis to me, bring them, um, but it's not likely a good option. All right. Do you guys offer no recourse loans for people who want to invest with a self-directed IRA? Unfortunately, no, we do not. We've got a good contact um, for a no recourse lender on our website. So again, hover over resources and you'll see there's a no recourse lender section. All right. Um, do you have to have previous investing experience uh, having rentals to be eligible for these loan products? No, you don't. If you own your primary home, believe it or not, you do not need to have prior rental experience. It's it's an exceptional program. and. I, I mean, there's no talk of this program going away or anything, so I don't want to alarm you, but guys, if you haven't been able to get financing till now, while this program's here, like I said, once again, it's not going anywhere from what I know of, but while it's here, get off the sidelines, you know, like take advantage of this. We live in a very volatile financial environment right now. Who knows what the future holds? Um, you know, if you can, I mean, you've been waiting to invest in real estate. The time is now. <laughs> Do you guys write HELOCs? Uh, unfortunately, no, we do not. A uh, couple of questions about clarification on when you mentioned two points being standard. Can you clarify what that means? Yeah, absolutely. So a, per a point is a percent of the loan amount. So on a $200,000 loan, a point is $2,000. Uh, it's basically a cost to lower that rate, and it is a fee to the lender, essentially. So it's a fee. Um, what you will find is with conventional loans in this market, I know a lot of us for the last six years, we haven't paid points on anything. Points are prevalent now. You're going to pay a point to point and a half to get a good rate. Any lender you go to in this market with these non-QM loans, um, they are standard with those two points. So effectively, um, to make it easy, it's, it's a lender fee and it's 2% of the loan amount as a fee for doing the loan. All right. Um, I don't know if we talked about this, uh, the areas that you cover. Are you licensed in all 50 or 49, I think I recall? Absolutely, yeah. So between my business partner and I, we kind of divided and conquered with licenses. We cover everywhere. This, this okay. um, 
Uh, Non-QM product does have one or two restrictions in states. Um, uh, this non-conventional product, and once again, we can handle conventional in these states, but the non-conventional non-QM loan is not available in Alaska, not available in Missouri, actually, and that's one where I think you guys okay. do work. Um, New York, Vermont, Rhode Island. So I think the only one there where um, people do or may invest in is, is mm. Missouri. This non-conventional product is not available in Missouri. However, we are licensed in Missouri and we do offer for Fannie Mae loans in Missouri. <clears throat> we don't currently okay. refer to anybody in Missouri at the moment, but I know there's a lot of investors who are interested in that market. Uh, the maximum loan to value. Maximum loan to value for purchases is 80%. So you could put just 20% down. For refis, it's, they kind of model conventional. So it's 75% loan to value for a cash out loan on a single family home and 70% loan to value on a multi-unit. Um, so yeah, once again, mirroring conventional. All right, and again, maybe mirroring, mirroring conventional when a home doesn't appraise, a borrower has to come in with the difference for, for to close the property, right? Correct, yeah. We don't run into that too much uh, these days uh, anymore. Can you help US expats overseas that want to burr in the United States? Uh, yes. Um, that's a, that's a, uh, well, so there's been a lot of changes around that recently and a lot of expats kind of are falling in a gray area as it relates to Fannie Mae and non-QM. Fannie Mae loans used to allow someone living and working outside of the U.S. to still get conventional loans. Um, as of about three months ago, they now require um, you to have a permanent address in the United States to be able to get those uh, loans. Now, for a non-traditional product, we offer straight foreign national loans, right? You could be a foreign national, um, no U.S. credit, nothing, and utilize these no-income documentation loans. However, if you are um, a U.S. citizen living out of the country, they generally require you to, like Fannie Mae, have a primary home in the U.S. We they do make case-by-case -case exceptions on those. We got three files in process right now where they did grant them. So if you are living and working outside of the U.S. as a U.S. citizen, um, there may be an opportunity to still help you. But um, in the last 90 days, a lot of those doors have been closing for whatever reason, which it defies logic, right? You could be a foreign national, right? One of your buddies living in whatever country you're living can come get one of these loans, but you don't fall in a gray area uh, where you're not a foreign national and you're not quite you know, living here. Um, but yeah, definitely reach out to me separately on that. Be happy to chat about it. Okay. Do you guys do asset-based loans, lending on a portfolio? How much higher are the rates for these loans? Um, we do offer asset-based loans to what I discussed, that the asset you're buying, but not a blanket cross-collateralized loan, um, which I think is what you're referring to. Um, obviously, we don't lend on anything but the collateral that you're trying to buy. So I guess the answer to that would be no, we don't offer um, asset-based or cross-collateralized or blanket mortgages. So that would be, I mean, just to clarify for my own understanding, like if I if I wanted to free up my 10 Fannie Freddies again and wanted to bundle them under one large portfolio loan, do you do that? No, that is not something okay. we do. And, one, and, and that's a, a great question because um, obviously it's a lot of, that was something a lot of people were doing in the past couple of years, but that was prior to a program like this coming out. Um, that strategy is getting less and less attractive because most of those 10 Fannie Mae loans we have are so low in rates. It's like, why replace those with market rates instead? Keep your 10 Fannie Mae loans at their low rates and utilize this non-QM product to go beyond. Um, most of the time that will pencil out better than you know losing all those low rates on your Fannie Mae portfolio. Right, certainly in today's interest climate. I know I had reached out to you personally, Richard, about like, is anybody doing portfolio loans with a line of credit? Because I, I hear so many, you know, very experienced investors kind of sharing that that was when they really put the jet fuel on their investing practices, when they refinanced their loans into a big portfolio loan and got a line of credit and they could go and buy distressed property just with the equity of the portfolio. But is anybody doing that anymore? Not really. A lot of those programs have kind of started, you know, disappearing from the market the last couple of years. And I think a lot of it is as programs like this non-QM and other ones came out and started being a little more attractive than some of these 
more non-traditional, um, uh, you know, balloons or cross collateralized mortgages, the prevalence of those have kind of decreased. I don't know of, of any lender that is offering those at the moment. So, you know, if you guys do, my clients are looking for it as well, as am I. Um, so I, so I can be that value add, or if any of your listeners have someone that's still doing it, let Leah or myself know, cause you know, we could use that contact as well. Yeah, definitely. Send either of us an email and we'll, we'll share the love. <clears throat> yep. All right. Are these DSCR loans and can you clarify what DSCR is? Yes. And yes, they are. Good question. So DSCR means debt service coverage ratio. And it essentially means what we were talking about earlier is is you know the qualifications based on the debt service coverage of that property so does it bring in enough rental income to offset the liability including taxes and insurance and the the dscr we look for for 20 percent down is one to one meaning it at least rents for what the mortgage payment is going to be so uh, yes good question see we have a lot of advanced students out there i know i know people showed up for this one <laughs> Uh, Roger wants to know, is there an age limit to apply for a 40-year loan? Uh, no, there's not. It's against uh, federal regulations to discriminate by law in this country. <laughs> Other countries, though, understandably, they're like, hey, you know what? I can't get a loan anymore because I'm 70 and you know they won't give me a 30 or 40-year loan. This country, you could be 105 and we will give you a 30-year fixed, believe it or not, <laughs> or 40-year because uh, it's against federal regulation to discriminate on age. So you're good to go. Right. All right, a couple more here, Richard. Um, what is the time frame to show that the property is leased, and what is the penalty if the property takes longer to rent? That's a good question. So these loans are made based off the projected rental income, based on that rent survey we spoke of. Once it's closed, we don't follow up on whether you leased it or not, right? I mean, hopefully you did for for all of our sake, right? Um, but yeah, there's there's no we don't check with you afterwards and make sure it was leased or anything like that. Once the loan closes, you're good to go. You make your payments on time. That's what we're interested in. So as long <laughs> as you're still making your mortgage payments while it's not leased, then, you know, we don't, we don't have any follow-up or input after that. All right. And you do loans on new construction, right? Yes, just absolutely. Not, not the construction to perm loans, but if you're, if you're, if the home has, is brand new and has just been completed by a builder, you do loans on those. Yeah, one thing to note on that is is if you're utilizing this non-QM program, let your agent, um, investment advisor, whoever know that you're going to need 45 to 60 days to close these versus the Fannie Mae loans are closer to 30 days. So just be aware of that. Okay. And I'm not sure if we mentioned this one, so forgive me if we had, but um, the requirement for can you explain the requirement for short-term rentals for these loans? Maybe it's in regard to um, the debt coverage. You know, are they looking at the long-term uh, rental rate for that property, or do they consider the nightly rate? So that's a great question, and and I can speak to that personally as well for for a loan I did. But um, typically, they're looking at a combination of what's prevalent for the area, right? So if you're buying um, a short-term rental in St. Augustine, Florida. And there's, you know, there's a good portion of the market are other short-term rentals. Then they will take into account a blend of the short-term and long-term lease market. Um, so far, we've had a couple deals like that, and we were really pleased with what the rents came in at. You know, one of them I think was a million-dollar property, and um, the projected rents came in at like sixty-eight hundred dollars. Um, you know, way higher than the long-term lease. So uh, they work really well with the short-term rentals, and they absolutely take into account the true potential of that property. Um, but yeah, that's a that's a really good question. That's one we get asked a lot by short-term investors, short-term rental investors is, are they going to take the long-term lease rate? And if they are, I'm not going to meet the one-to-one -one DSCR, right? The debt mm -hmm. service coverage ratio. Um, but remember, if you put 25% down, it does not need to meet that one-to-one -one ratio. Yeah. Oh man, these questions are getting in the weeds, but what data source do they use <laughs> for those for those metrics? Are they using AirDNA? No, the, the appraisers actually go out and physically pull the data, right? When they go to home and do the appraisal, uh, they'll actually pull rent comparables beforehand and go take pictures of those rent comparables. They'll drive by them. So it's not an automated um, uh, system that they use. 
All right. And what is the longest rate lock option that you currently offer? Great question. So for Fannie Mae conventional loans, we offer up to four month locks. These non-traditional loans, they just change their policy. They're only 30 days, which means typically you can only lock in once they have underwriter approval. Remember I said earlier, these loans can take 45 to 60 days um, to, to finalize. So as of three days ago, they announced this. Our strategy is once we have our initial approval, typically we're two and a half weeks in at that point, then uh, we can go ahead and secure those rates. Now, on the long-term lock period, we, we as well as a lot of other lenders out there offer an extended lock period up to a year. I know I said four months, but that's that's for the standard lock. These extended lock periods typically are, you're gonna pay a one to 2% upfront non-refundable fee, right, out of your pocket at the time of lock. And you're gonna pay a premium in interest rate over the duration to take advantage of that one-year lock. So I'm not trying to dissuade you from them, but that long-term lock program would have been amazing if all of us pulled the trigger on it in November, right? Before <laughs> rates went up, but now rates have already gone up, right? And, you know, pretty dramatically. So if you're taking extended lock, you have to ask yourself, typically you're going to pay an upfront fee and you're going to bet that rates are going to, and you're going to pay a premium on rate. A lot of times up to half a percent higher than the current market rate so you'd be making a bet that a year from now rates are going to be over half a percent higher and with you paying that additional point so you know a lot of times it's 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 a cool product that's available but a lot of times it may or may not pencil out so you know definitely analyze that on your transaction yeah either way you look at it you're speculating to some degree how much do you want to pay to speculate is maybe the yeah. question <laughs> So I, I always like to end on these um, because our resource partners are savvy investors like yourself. Um, talk to us a little bit about uh, where you're investing right now, what markets you're hottest on, what you're seeing out there as an investor. Absolutely, and like I guess another good question. So as we all know, it's getting harder and harder to find deals that fit the bucket that we've always had, right? Our goals, uh, the first thing as we discussed earlier, it's important to start looking at things a little broader and analyzing other investments out there. Um, I personally, am, I'm pretty diversified in my portfolio, real estate and not real estate, but I've had the most success with my real estate portfolio and I feel like the most control, right? Everything else can swing, even stocks. I mean, they could swing so wildly whereas I feel like real estate's been the most consistent um, for me. So in the last year, I have picked up a, a short-term rental. Short-term rentals are a good way um, to find cash flow and the returns you want in this market, but also it enables you to buy an asset that you otherwise never thought you would buy, right? Like you never thought you would buy a, a rental out of state for 500, 700, 800, a million dollars. Um, and now it enables you to buy higher quality assets as well. And it is a different experience for you, right, as well. It's going to be a nicer home a lot of times in a nicer area than normally you wouldn't have ever been on your radar as an investor. Um, but also, I still am looking at long-term rentals as well. Um, you know, I've been exploring, you know, markets like, uh, obviously, Florida. I have five doors in Florida right now. But Florida, to me, is still an area that offers a lot of growth. It's the high, most visited uh, state in the country, one of the most visited um, you know, states in the world of any country, um, but also has a good demographics and the jobs following it. Um, but it is getting harder and harder once again to um, find cash flow. So I get a lot of investors that ask me, you know, where they should invest or where I'm investing or what the right market is. And, and as you know, that, that answer is different for every single person. You know, the advice that we're going to give you if you're 65 and about to retire and trying to replace income is going to be different than advice we give maybe a 30-year-old, you know, that that is investing more long-term, that has a high income, that isn't looking to pocket that cash flow. Um, so the right answer is going to be different, obviously, for uh, different clients. And, you know, you could buy the best property in the worst market, you know, worst market, or you could buy the best, the worst property in the best market, you know, and analyzing that deal, analyzing the market, analyzing that transaction is extremely important. And, you know, knowing what your goals are also. Don't just chase a 6% or 8% return because that's what everyone says to do, right? What are you going to do with that return? And why is that important to you? Or is that the most important thing to you? 
right? And I asked the people that, okay, you're gonna make 6% return on this property, an extra $300 a month, right? Is that an extra dinner or two? You know, how important is that to you versus the broad level, right? What is this gonna look like a decade from now when you actually may want to use the cash flow, right? And like anything, if you don't touch it now, it's gonna be bigger later. And, um, you know, so I think it's really important for everyone out there is, you know, there's tons and tons of good markets. Um, don't pay attention to what people call a good or a bad market, because you know, if you do your research, you're gonna find a property that works uh, anywhere. But, you know, and, and go visit the market. You know, it's great to spend a weekend and, you know, go take your spouse, take your significant other, go spend a weekend there, look at some properties, get an idea of the area. and. I think what you guys will find is not only does it give you more confidence to invest in new markets, um, but you also start to enjoy real estate on a different aspect, right? You know, it's nice going and getting lunch and then driving by one or two of your rentals that you have in that area. Yeah, you said it earlier. Clearly, Richard, we've we've drunk the Kool-Aid of, of real estate investing. It sounds like a perfect afternoon in my book. Um, well, I, I am so appreciative, Richard. This was a great conversation. I think you offer some um, you know, really creative loan products for our investors. Thanks so much for coming on and sharing the information. Again, everybody, uh, to get Richard's contact information, uh, if you're not already a member of Real Wealth, first become one. Um, and then once you're a member of Real Wealth, you can log on to that investor portal. You can see all of our resource partners, including Richard at Supreme Lending, um, on that resource page. So um, thanks again, Richard, for joining us. And thanks, everybody, for staying with us over the hour. Thank you. We'll talk soon.